Welcome to the final section of my series of audio lectures on experientialism. This is actually my third take of uh, th this episode or section, um, which is actually unique because the other ones were all in a single take. Uh, but it's not entirely my fault because uh, my phone actually crashed and wiped the product of the second take. And the first take I did uh, when half asleep and wasn't really coherent. So in, in this section, I'm going to essentially take all of the epistemological tools that I laid out in my previous sections and in, investigate using them a particular quirk of um, epistemology that they imply and that I, I mentioned in a few places in the previous sections. And this will act as, um, to some degree, a bridge between my epistemology and my ethics. There are actually many more links between my ethics and my epistemology, but most of them are uh, more readily considered under the heading of ethics, and so will belong in my other series, uh, even though uh, they do reach into my epistemology as well. So in this section, I'm going to be wrestling with uh, one particular problem, which uh, I've variously called both the problem of free will and the problem of moral responsibility. The fact that it has both of those names kind of indicates uh, what the meaning of the problem is, and it's essentially this. Uh, the way that we're used to thinking about ethics um, in uh, standard philosophy is uh, that if you know, you take the hard determinist position, it's impossible or very difficult to assign moral responsibility to any particular individual because they're just another link in the causal chain. And so it's hard to, to pick any particular person out um, in any interesting way. And now I know this sounds like a lot like ethics, but this actually... Um, my solution to this problem comes out of my epistemology uh, quite readily. So, um, to lay the groundwork, I mentioned in the second section of this series the idea that in relation to our cognitive processes, the most reliable means of information that we have is actually introspection. Because introspection itself is a function of our mental uh, our cognitive uh, ability, our cognitive processes. And so it's intimately tied to them. And so turning it back on itself uh, is a much more certain way to understand it because it has a self-referential ability than uh, the indirect route of taking, you know, using our senses to get something out of the envelope that then... Um, mirrors back to us um, because that requires a two-step process, right? That requires relying on our senses to accurately understand the envelope and then relying on whatever we're using the envelope to accurately reflect what our mental, our cognitive processes are. Meanwhile, introspection is already in there. It's already as certain as anything can be. And so this actually is a very important tool that can help us try to solve um, one of the sub-problems of the problem of free will, which is uh, essentially whether we have free will at all. So there are two ways that I can approach the, this idea of uh, libertarian free will. Um, one of them is to say that there are only two mechanisms that I can think of to, or three mechanisms that I can think of that can lead to a mind coming to a certain conclusion. The first is coming to a certain conclusion based on the character of that mind, so the, the way the individual ways that it processes th processes things, and the data that it has available. The second way that I can think of is essentially um, coming to a conclusion 
based on random chance, a sort of probabilistic event out of a uh, set of possible conclusions. And then the third is to have this conclusion sort of generated and then imposed from, the, from outside this mind. So it either comes from inside the mind and is uh, determined by properties of the mind, or inside the mind is not determined by properties of the mind, or it comes from outside the mind by some means that doesn't necessarily really matter. And so the problem with libertarian free will is that none of these options look like libertarian free will. If what you think is determined by random chance, then you don't have control over what you think. Random chance does. So you could have willed otherwise, but it's still, it's not uh, you in, in the sort of metaphysical libertarian free will sense that's willing it. Um, and, and in the first uh, option, um, the, the properties of, of the character of your mind um, are, uh, are set. Um, because either either they're set externally and cannot be changed, or, well, they must be set externally originally, because there must be um, a mind to actually do anything, um, and that mind cannot uh, jumpstart itself into existence. And so, it must that mental character must originally be externally determined, and even if it can be internally determined, that requires a decision that... again that um, must either come up from the character of the mind itself or from the other two options um, that I gave, um, none of which is free. And so um, whether the character is fixed or changeable, it is not um, a product of some kind of metaphysical process that could be called free. And the conclusions that come from that mind by the data that it has and the way the individual way that it thinks are set by those properties because those are the only two factors that could contribute to a conclusion arrived at from a mental process. Um, now, the whole problem with that line of reasoning, um, however it, good it might seem, is that it is still essentially an appeal to ignorance. There might be some other metaphysical process by which libertarian free will could manifest itself in our mental processes, and I'm just not aware of it. So let me come at it from a different angle. The way that we normally conceive of the internal experience of free will is how, uh, aligns with how we experience things in the day-to-day. Um, that it's us thinking something, and we um, we follow that process every step through, and it doesn't surprise us. And the way that we think of determinism, um, the way the way we uh, intuit what being a determined being would be like, would be like being a remote control uh, robot or a puppet, where what you think next or what you do next is a surprise to you. And you're not there for the process, and so it doesn't feel like you've uh, you've been part of that. But I argue that actually um, our intuitions are flipped, and actually um, it is determinism that should match with what introspection tells us about the process of our um, our thinking, because. Determinism states that uh, what you think should be determined by your past experiences, your context, your current experiences, and the nature of the mind that you are. And so if things are determined, you should be along for epi- every step of the process, you as a thing that experiences qualia. And so, uh, and, and you should uh, understand and uh, not be surprised by the conclusions and actions that you come to with determinism. But with free will, if if what you think is not essentially determined, 
then it cannot be determined by the character of the mind that you are or and the experiences that you've had because that those things mixing the, the process and the data that the process is given is a necessarily deterministic means of coming to conclusions and so if free will were true you would actually not come to conclusions based on the kind of thinking mind that you are and the information you have. And so if free will were true, it should actually contradict how introspectively uh, we experience our thoughts and conclusions. In essence, if free will were true, we should be surprised by the conclusions we come to. And so from this... Um, we can essentially use this tool of introspection to analyze what it feels like to think and try to match it up correctly with um, what we expect the various uh, metaphysical ways of thinking should match. And note that throughout en uh, none of this have I ever mentioned... Um, physics or neurology or anything like that. And because, and I think this is important, one of the sidetracks that we can often get into is the, uh, you know, the, the neurology and physics of determinism and free will. But we don't need those tools to affirm right off the bat that it is, is essentially impossible for us to have free will. Um, and let me outline a third argument. Um, for, for determinism. And this is essentially, um, at least I believe, uh, Schopenhauer's argument, that we cannot will what we will. Um, at least not infinitely. Perhaps we can, you know, desire something in the short term, but have some overriding desire that can change our short-term desire. But can we change that overriding desire? Well, if we could, we'd need another desire, another will to override that. And then, if we wanted to change that, we'd never need another will to override that. And so, in order to be able to ultimately change everything that we will, we would need an infinite regress of different levels of will. And um, the problem with that is that those, all of those wills would have to be resolved and come to the conclusion of what they desire before we can act. But if we have an infinite number of them, then we can't do that because humans have a finite lifespan and a finite amount of mental space. So something that is infinite can resolve in infinite time and infinite space, but in finite time and finite space, it's not possible. Without a, some shortcut, at least. Um, okay, so moving on from this. If we can't have free will, then how do we assign moral responsibility? Well, this is where um, my tool of performative basicness uh, comes into play again. Because when we think, it is a necessary performatively basic idea that we are an important causal factor in what we think. Because we have to choose to think, and as we think, we cannot escape from the idea that we are thinking that there is some process that we are doing, not that is being done to us. And to attempt to deny that is to choose to think and uh, come to certain conclusions. And in the process, your internal experiences um, uh, affirm what you are attempting to initiate thought in order to deny. This also goes for action. When you act... If you act to deny the idea that you act with a purpose um, and volitionally, so intentionally and volitionally, you are in the process of doing that, choosing to act with a goal in mind, so both volitionally and intentionally. And uh, to deny that is to claim that what you are saying is completely involuntary, and that essentially undercuts the uh, reasonableness of your claim. Um, and so the, the very performative basicness itself indicates that although we can't have libertarian free will, we must affirm the idea that we are an important causal factor in our own thoughts and actions. Because to give that up 
to add another argument to the pile, would be essentially to die. Because it would be to refuse to take responsibility for the possibility of your action or thought. And so you would cease to act or think, and therefore cease to exist. But there is another further argument, apart from performative basicness, that's actually um, quite demonstrative as well. It's a thought experiment. Uh, so, I imagine there's a, um, a black box, and it's got a keypad on one side and a little display on the other. You can tap a number into the keypad and hit enter, and on the other side, a number is displayed. Now, there are only a couple things that you know about this box. First of all, you know it's extremely complicated. Perhaps you've x-rayed it or something, and although you couldn't figure out the alien technology that powers it, you could tell that it is um, far more complex than any computer that humanity has ever constructed. In addition, you know that although you can generally vaguely predict the, what number will come out based on what number you put in, um, it's very difficult to predict it with any amount of precision. Um, so maybe you can guess it within a um, hundred, but um, guessing it down to the exact number is essentially impossible, and it gets exponentially more difficult the closer you try to estimate. Um, and in addition, you know that there are many other boxes of equal complexity, equal difficulty to predict, and, predict, and each of them when given the same number, produces different results. Now, let's analyze the causal chain that occurs when you enter a number and another comes out. An important part of the causal chain is, of course, you inputting the number. That cannot be denied. And an other important causal factor is you, on the other side of the box, looking at the number. However, I think it is difficult to deny that it is the box itself that it is that is the most um, important and influential causal factor, because um, it's it's you putting in the number um, had no idea what the end of that causal chain would be because of the box, or at least very little idea, and and therefore very little intention, and additionally. There are a lot of causes and effects happening within the box that are directly important to what number comes out. Um, th that that um, lead directly to the number and predict directly to the number in a way that your input of the number and the process that you used to come up with the number you didn't put uh, did not uh, directly, um, almost teleologically, lead to the number in the end. Additionally, that particular box is very important to the number that came out because any other box or any other system probably, almost definitely, would have come up with something completely different. So now let's compare this to humans. The human mind is, um, if you look, look into it actually, um, far faster, far more complex than um, even the largest supercomputer that we've ever constructed. Additionally, Humans are incredibly difficult to predict. Um, even if you have access to all of the environmental data and all of the uh, data in the event, it's difficult to figure out exactly what any uh, one person will do um, just based on that information um, in that situation. And um, so I think that's a, a good argument to present the idea that um, well, that when someone does something, um, one of the most important causal factors in the entire chain is the person that decides to do it. And the importance of the other factors in the causal chain, including other humans, depends on uh, how predictably they could have led to that end consequence. So, for instance, if someone murders someone else, and that other person was purposefully saying things to goad them into doing that, perhaps threatening them or their family, then 
um, it, it was more predictable that w it would lead to that outcome. Um, or, it, or if the murderer's parents uh, brought him up in a way that, um, you know, uh, encouraged killing or something, right? But, um, and so in that instance, perhaps, the most important causal factor is still the murderer, but the others could be somewhat held responsible. Meanwhile, if the murderer just killed a random innocent person and had fairly normal had fa fairly normal uh, parents, or at least parents that didn't do anything that would predictably lead to a murder, even if they abuse the child, um, abuse can just as easily lead to a pacifist as a sociopath. So, um, yeah, and uh, mo moving on from this too. Um, when we analyze an action that is intentional and volitional, it's essentially necessary from the concept of action that um, an action that aimed at a particular goal had a certain... Um, the actor had a certain reason to um, think that the action that they chose would further that goal. And that that thought is based on the beliefs about the world and how the world functions, and therefore the effects of the action that the actor had. And so, any action that is taken necessarily demonstrates beliefs about the practical and predictive reality of the, realities of the world on the part of the person who is acting. Furthermore, the goal that is selected is necessarily considered by the actor to be valuable. Because what we valuable is what we choose over other options. And so, and to choose to do one action is to uh, refrain from uh, doing another action. And so it demonstrates that the goal um, of that action was more important to, the, the, to that actor than the goal of the other actions that they could have taken at that time. And so, um, what an action necessarily presents to us is a belief about the world and a value uh, bound into one. And this is essentially what I call a maxim. A maxim is essentially a template to describe the, um, the action. It includes the subject, the object, the verb, and the uh, situational context uh, around the um, uh, that action, including the goal. And so any action um, indicates, but importantly as well, um, it is not the goal that is just valued here. Any action also indicates that the actor believed that it was permissible, by definition, because uh, one does not take actions that one believes are not permissible in that specific circumstance, in that specific context. Yes, many people take actions that they believe are not generally permissible. But every action that each individual takes in that individual moment, they believe that it is permissible. And this adds another um, piece of evidence to the stack that tells us that even if we don't have free will, we can still identify who is at fault for um, a certain outcome. Because... Not only can we determine who is the most important causal factor, we can also look at who held the maxim that the goal that was being acted at was valuable and that the action that was taken was effective and permissible. And so if a murderer murders someone, and let's say they had you know a poor home life, yet the parents, we can assume, um, did not were not the ones that held the maxim that murder was permissible in service of um, some valuable end, and that that end was valuable. Um, I'm going to expand more on this idea of maxims in my ethical series, uh, but I think uh, that sort of outlines well uh, my point here. Although it's impossible, even philosophically, even based on introspection, to hold that we have free will. That does not mean that it is impossible to hold that we are um, the most important causal factor in our um, 
in our own actions um, and that we can be held responsible for those actions. Because when someone makes an act, takes, does something, it is still, even if they are not ultimately responsible for the way that they are, it is still them that is taking the action. And uh, that must be dealt with in some way. Um, which, which again, I'll deal with what that really means um, in my ethical series. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is a very complex topic. I just want to jump back to the performative basicness of the idea that uh, one is important to uh, what one thinks. Uh, this is something that's very difficult to explain, but essentially, um, if one wants to... Uh, I mean, this is... So, uh, here's another angle of approach to it. Um, and this is sort of based on uh, Michael H Humer's um, argument here. Um, if if one wants to uh, be happy, um, as I've said before, one has to be aware that the envelope affects one's uh, state, one's emotional state. And one also has to be aware that one's actions affect the envelope. And one also has to be aware that one's uh, beliefs um, affect how effective one's actions are in changing the envelope in the desired ways. And so if one desires to be happy, one must figure out beliefs that are good at predicting the outcomes of certain actions. But this drive to believe uh, true, or I guess predictive, things about the envelope is something that presupposes that one has a choice in what one thinks in some way. Because essentially, um, if one didn't have a choice, then there would be no reason in attempting to believe true things. Because, well, why would you bother? Ought implies can um, but yet we do attempt to believe true things and often succeed and often change our minds. And so there must be some important way in which we control what we think. But the important part here is that we don't control this desire to be happy and therefore to believe true things. Um, that, and so, and we, so we don't have free will. We're still motivated by that. It reminds me of uh, the Bentham quote. Um, one second. Yes, um, nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. It is for them alone to point out what we ought to do, as well as to, to determine what we shall do. Uh, yeah, there's more, but see, that's the point. So, one analogy that I used a long time ago to describe how I see human will is... Uh, a series of uh, weights that are tied to each other. Um, and you can use, let's say there's one central uh, gigantic stone, um, and, th and that is our motivation for happiness, or pain, uh, the absence of pain and the presence of pleasure, to use Bentham's terminology. Um, but chained to that central stone, are many other stones of varying sizes, and these are our subsidiary desires. A desire of truth elevated almost to an end in itself because of how important it is to our happiness. A desire for fellowship that elevated to the same reason, uh, to the same level for the same reason. A desire for justice, honor, um, all of these things. A sense of community, uh, yeah, a number, right? And each stone can be used um, as leverage to move the others. Sometimes many stones in use and must be used to move um, another if the other is bigger. Um, but uh, happiness cannot be moved. It's the sort of core thing that motivates everything else. Because, um, But this happiness can be used as leverage to move other things that we think of as uh, 
uh, desires in themselves. And so we have this illusion of free will because we can change what we think or desire. But what's really happening is we're using something that's already fixed as a lever to move something that was only partially fixed. And so, in essence, um, we, are, we are still determined, but I think far less determined than um, the vulgar uh, intuitional determinists might think. Um, yes, and, and this lead, leads directly into my ethical theory, so I think I'll leave it there. Um, but the importance of this to epistemology is that it means that we are not um, eternally determined to believe anything we believe. Because while, while we are determined, we are ultimately determined by our desire for happiness and what we know. And so if our desire of happiness motivates us to greater truth then we can use it as a lever to shift all of the other things about ourselves and reorder them using uh, the, you know, using what we know um, as accurately as possible. And so this is how it is possible for us to believe as many true things and as few th false things as possible while still being essentially determined creatures. One final note here. Um, and I, I think this is interesting. Um, so there's this uh, notion in some uh, sects of Christianity, including the one that uh, I used to follow, that, um, in fact, humans don't have free will um, because God is omniscient and he determined the initial conditions of the universe. And so, of course, when he did that, he knew, knew exactly what that would mean for every action that anyone would take in the future. Um and, of course, if anything happened that he didn't like, he could simply change it, and so, um, and he would. And so there's no way in which we could have free will. But yet, the idea was that we still held responsibility for our um, actions, such that God wasn't uh, evil for judging us, even though he determined us. But... Uh, and, and one might wonder um, what my idea of uh, responsibility within determinism, which might be considered a form of compatibilism, means for this argument. Um, and it actually um, undercuts this point, because um, the point that I made was um, the person that takes an action is... Uh, most responsible for that action because they're the most important causal step that made it possible because the other causal steps couldn't directly predict or intend uh, the, that outcome and because that person actually held a maxim about uh, the morality of um, that action when he took it or they took it. But in the case of God, God is omniscient and omnipotent. And so, whenever anyone takes an action, God does directly, precisely, and specifically intend that action to take place. And uh, God is the most important causal factor for anything happening in the universe under Christian theology. And additionally, uh, by allowing it or, or designing it to take place, God himself is also holding a maxim that um, that thing is acceptable. And so even under this uh, sort of compatibilist notion, um, non-free will Christian theology uh, falls apart like a rotting log. Um, so yeah, that, that's a final note, I think, uh, which is useful to illustrate uh, the, some of the finer points of this idea. And of course, um, this will be spun out uh, further in my later videos.